I would like to, first of all, talk about discerning different voices. And specifically, I want to talk first about the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then also, I would like to contrast that with the voice of apostasy. Okay? So we need to understand that there are spirits behind the voices. When we have a conversation with a person, when we hear something online, on television, when we are uh, conversing with anybody at any time, thoughts that come into our mind, there's a source. Where does a voice come from? We need to understand that the voice of the Spirit will lead us to practice holy moral living. The scripture calls the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Spirit the Spirit of holiness. So everything he speaks and does and prompts God's people to do will produce the character and the nature and the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So those who are led by the Spirit of God, the Bible says, are in fact the sons of God. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ, Spirit of Holiness, and his voice will speak of those things. He's called the Spirit of Adoption, and he confirms to those who walk with him that we are joint heirs with Christ. All right? He's also called the Spirit of Truth, meaning that he is going to show us mysteries. He's going to take us into his word he will cause us to bear witness to what he is teaching his people. He will also warn us if we begin to take a step in a wrong direction. But being the, the spirit of truth, he's going to guide us into all truth. All truth concerning the bride. All truth concerning the judgment of the great whore. All truth concerning these many reports that we are hearing about, the psyops that are actively at work in the nations of the world, the false flags, the mind control, the bioweapons, the cyber warfare, the cyber attacks, continuing lawlessness, the collapsing of cities, of civil war, of that which concerns um, censorship, that which concerns uh, a release of other viruses, and on and on and on it goes. The biological warfare that he's warned us about for years. Events in the Middle East unfolding. It says that the spirit of truth will show us these things, and he will take that which is of Christ. Jesus said he will take that which is mine, and he will show it to you. Okay? He is also called the comforter, beloved. Because as we continue to walk in the days ahead, he will comfort us as we are dealing in opposition, suffering, and persecution. He will check us. Uh, again, this is something that I, I think is really important to address. His voice will correct us when we stumble and fall. There's a huge difference between conviction and condemnation. The scriptures tell us there is therefore no more condemnation to them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. So he will convict us, but if we stumble and fall, we need to understand he will reprove us, but he doesn't condemn us. So if we're hearing voices of condemnation or accusation, that does not come from him. If you are born from above, if you are abiding in Christ and seeking to walk in the Spirit. And again, I, I think this is appropriate to say that dropping the cross is not the same as throwing it away. All right, so I'm talking about now the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to a people who are walking in love who are attempting to lay down their life, to carry their cross daily, to not look back, to seek him, and to do what they know to do, to walk in the light that they have. Now, beloved, when we're young in the Lord, we're all learning. Whether we're young in the Lord or if we've walked with him for decades, we will miss the mark. 
I'm hoping that tonight that some of the things that I'll be able to share will help us to make a distinction between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of apostasy because it has absolutely permeated the church. It has permeated the religious circles. It's everywhere. Now I want to talk just for a minute and compare that with the voice of apostasy. Okay? Let me read one scripture and then we'll talk about the voiced voice of apostasy. The voice of the Lord, by the way, whispers, come. Okay? He does say, come. All, uh, many, many times through scripture, he says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11, 28 and 30. I want to contrast now when the voice of apostasy begins to speak that we might identify some of the attributes of that voice. Okay? So again, the voice of apostasy has a spirit behind it just like the voice of the Lord has a spirit behind it being the Holy Spirit. First of all, the voice of apostasy will reflect the condition of Laodicea. Now, these are Jesus' words, okay? And he, we all know he doesn't mince words. He speaks the truth. He said, I'm going to describe what you look like to me. He said, you're wretched, you're miserable, poor, blind and naked. So the condition of Laodicea, which is a, an individual, a group of people, a congregation, that is distracted, lukewarm, and out of fellowship with Jesus Christ, the voice of apostasy will be known uh, by certain features and attributes that I want to talk to you about. Number one, and I've found this when I've talked to people, I'll ask them about the congregations where they go, and I recently had this conversation with a, uh, a relative, and I asked, well, does the pastor, the senior pastor, ever talk about end times prophecy in the book of Daniel or in the Olivet Discord, the book of Revelation? And the answer was no, because it frightens and scares the people. Now, the voice of apostasy will discourage believers from learning about end times prophecy, events, and eschatology, which in fact is against the command of Jesus. Jesus specifically tells us to be vigilant and to watch. We know that from the, the Olivet Discord, Discourse and all through God's Word. So the voice of apostasy suggests pursuing a self-life, which is the broad road that leads to destruction. Okay, it also is deceitful because it's a mixture. It's a blend. Okay, it gives a false sense of security. It tells people all they have to do to be saved is ask Jesus into their heart, repeat a sinner's prayer, and regardless of their behavior, they will go to heaven when they die. That is deceitful, and that is not scriptural. The voice of apostasy will lull men to sleep. It's like a smooth voice. You will not hear a piercing word. It will not confront sin. It will not call for repentance. It will not call for holiness or denying Self. Okay? The voice of apostasy is the voice of Babylon. And we've talked about, um, you know, I know that Johnny's talked about it. Um, there's a lot to be said about mystery Babylon. There's a lot to be said about religious Babylon. Uh, but let me just try to simplify it by saying that Babylon, in its simplest form, is a man-made structure. In fact, what it does is it persuades people to pledge allegiance to a system, which is a mixture of religion and politics, economics and social values. And it supports a clergy class, and it appoints elites to rule over the people. Now, Jesus, all through his word, both Old and New Testaments, calls his people to come out of Babylon. So he wants us to come out of the mixture. And one of the things Jesus addresses was also um, the elitist and the clergy mentality, which he 
he calls the deeds of the Nicolaitans in Revelation 2, 15, he says, I hate that thing of men lording over people. First of all, it's the Lord's flock. It's not a man's flock. All right? Um, one of the things about this voice of apostasy, it will not talk about being a bond servant. It will not address the fact that those who profess to be disciples, in fact, pledge their allegiance to their master for life. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that we're bought with a price. Basically, what that means is that our lives are not our own. All right? So if a disciple is carrying their cross and truly trying to walk with the Lord, they will understand and know that they don't have the right to just watch what they want to watch on television, listen to what they want to listen to, spend their money the way they think they should, because they are dying to the concept, concept of me, myself, and I, because the bond servant knows that they only want to do what their master wants is best for them and is right for the kingdom of God. So you will hear no message of the crucified life coming from the camp of apostasy. Uh, sadly, this voice is responsible for initiating counterfeit revivals. I want to just say something about some of the counterfeit revivals that have swept through the nation and the world. Every true revival begins with weeping and repentance. It doesn't start with laughing and with people being out of control. In fact, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. Much of the counterfeit revival that we've heard about and that I have been exposed to personally, okay, I, again, I've been around a while, I've seen a lot of this stuff. There is actually emotional manipulation. There is sensationalism. There's strange fire. There's lying signs and wonders. And the emphasis is being placed upon spiritual experiences and not the word of God, not the message of the gospel of the kingdom, it is, it is uh, gone down another path. And so what's happened with these counterfeit revivals, by the way, which is um, brought on through another, the voice of apostasy, there's a spirit behind it. Uh, those who are propagating these false counterfeit revivals are propagating false doctrine and they're encouraging non-biblical practices. And I won't go into detail on that tonight because I'd like to address the spirit of religious error perhaps next week when we're together. So there's so much error that has come in. There are false doctrines being introduced. This is the same stuff that we're seeing with the buying and the selling of the gifts, with the competition, with um, some of the things that we're hearing on television, over the internet. Um, beloved, it's, let me just say that the modern day church of Laodicea is everywhere. And what all of us need to understand, and I certainly get it, is that it begins with each of us individually. We must seek the Lord, we must press into the Lord, because clearly what Jesus wrote about the church of Laodicea he was knocking to get in. He was, they were not in fellowship with him. They thought they were doing all the right things. But they had opened a door and that had led to a state of apostasy. So there are individuals who fall into apostasy. There are congregations, families that fall into apostasy. There are nations that fall into uh, the state of apostasy. And uh, it's a counterfeit. It is a blend. It is a mixture uh, of different faiths. Um, it will not talk about what it means to count the cost of following Jesus. Now, even many times, if you listen to certain messages and they're trying to present the gospel, they will not and go into detail about what it means to count the cost. It means we lose our own life, beloved. And the voice of apostasy will not address that. Jesus said, you have to forsake all to be my disciple. And what they will emphasize, and I'm not saying God doesn't use them, they will have what they call altar calls. Now, God can and does use altar calls. Please don't misunderstand me. But 
the terms need to be explained, and they're not needing, they are not being explained. And for that reason, I believe that many have fallen away when persecution comes or opposition comes or hardship comes or somebody becomes sick or you just walk through life. People don't continue with their faith. I have read um, uh, statistics that nine out of ten people who go forward at any given time at large crusades where people are asked to come forward to receive, quote, receive Christ, and they say a prayer and they confess their sin again, that's a good place to start, but I believe where the church has missed it is not talked about the fact and the scriptures that I shared with you at the beginning is that Jesus calls those who walk with him bond servants and love slaves. That's another, another translation calls it back. And so what happens is if someone loses their job, if their marriage ends in divorce, if sickness and illness or bankruptcy or um, terrible things happen to them, they begin to fall away. And I believe the church as a whole has missed it because we've not talked to the people about what it means to pay a price to walk with Christ, what it means to endure through the seasons, what it means when you lose everything. If you don't lose everything and the blessings of God then become the focus instead of the Lord Jesus himself, who is the one who gave the blessings. All right, so basically that voice of apostasy calls people, it causes people to depart from and fall away from biblical truth and faith. And it will tolerate heresy, and it presents truth with error. And beloved, one of the reasons I'm convinced that people are drawn away and swept into the movements that now are all through the nation, at least of America and in other parts of the world, is because truth and error are both uh, given together, whereas the Spirit of the Lord reminds us, okay, the voice of the Holy Spirit reminds us to meditate in his work day and night. I mean, in the book of Joshua, uh, uh, choose this day whom you will serve, we're told to meditate in the word day and night night we're told to study to uh, show ourselves approved uh, there's a reason God wants us to meditate in his word there is a reason he wants us to sit with him and ask him father could you please by your Holy Spirit explain this to me I don't understand it could you please show me what the truth means here because I'm confused because I do believe that he will because he said in his word uh, Jesus said, I, he will take that which is mine and he will show it unto you. Again, these promises are conditional. I believe it's clear that, and we all know, that there are many people who we would call whistleblowers. There are many people who gather information and present it to the public, and much of it is facts, okay? There are people on television, there are people online, uh, and, and some that I have listened to that I don't listen to anymore. Uh, one of the things that I'm aware of is that it's more important and it must remain our focus is to seek the Lord himself and not just try to seek information from him. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's just to be with him, to be in his word, to seek him, to have the mind of Christ as opposed to just saying, I need to gather this information, I need to find this out, because, beloved, much of what's being presented to us online, on television, through different ministries, are facts, all right? Facts. Now, facts are subject to change, all right? But truth and the spirit of truth does not change, all right? The Holy Spirit's voice, who is the spirit of truth, will always tell you what is absolutely correct. What we have is such a mixture, even in the camp of those who are well-meaning. Facts are being presented, but there's also speculation and opinion, and that's part of the problem. That's where confusion can come in, because sometimes the human uh, soul will interject things that are not accurate. Sometimes, because we all have different opinions, because we all have different perspectives. If we're not seeking the Lord first, 
And let me tell you, you're going to have to cut out a whole lot of things to do that. He wants our priorities in order. He wants our lives in order. He wants homes set in order. He wants us to seek, seek him and not just information because the Lord has shown me also. If it's just information we're seeking, that can become an idol and God hates idolatry. Trying to get information from this, trying to extract, trying, 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 and it becomes like a... Uh, uh, something that we're being pushed into because religious spirits will actually drive the people and um, there will be those who get caught up in a spirit of performance. But the Lord wants us to come, come unto him, all right? He wants us to come unto him. Now, let me just share something also about the voice of apostasy. Uh, those who are have allowed themselves... Um, to step back from Jesus as his, their first love. Let me just use that. Let's start that way. Temporal pursuits can actually take precedence over Jesus as our first love. All right? If he is not our first love, okay, if that person stops drawing close to the Lord, all right, they may be attending religious services. They may be reading things. They may be... Uh, uh, gathering information. They may be a good person. But what's happened is the spirit of this age and the cares of this life begin to overtake them and they have no time to spend alone with the Lord. In other words, he has ceased being their first love. And you can begin to tell by the speech coming out of their mouth. There will be a, a lack of sobriety. I want to just pause right here for a minute and say... Um, in Jeremiah 48, 11, God was talk the Lord was talking about Moab. Moab was a nation of people, and what's happened with the voice of apostasy, it causes people to come under the influence of another wine. So this would be a worldly intoxication. It's not the new wine of the Spirit, okay? Now, in Scripture, Jesus makes an appeal for sobriety, doesn't he? So the voice of apostasy doesn't awaken people, okay, or lead them to transformation. It just keeps them busy. It keeps them going in circles on a quest to do this, on a quest to do that. Cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, because the spirit of this age is driving them or pressuring them to do anything that it can except keeping them from coming unto Jesus, okay, because... Spirit and the bride say, come, right? And what I read to you about what John was told, uh, he heard a voice saying, come. He heard um, an angel say, come. He heard the Lord say, come. So Jesus will always say, come to me first, all right? So um, what happens with, in Jeremiah 48 with the Moabites, um, basically this was a people who never changed. Uh, it said that they had not been poured out. And in the process of making wine, it would be filtered out, would be poured from one vessel to another through some kind of a filter or a strainer. And the whole point of it was to get the dregs out. Now, the dregs in wine would be the sediment and the mixture in the wine. And um, God told the Moabites, uh, your scent has not changed, your flavor has not changed, you look exactly like you did before. So... The voice of apostasy and the mixture that has entered Christendom uh, is not awakening people. It's not helping to lead them to transformation because, again, transformation begins on the inside. There will be no bodily transformation unless there is an inner transformation first. So the Lord told Moab in Jeremiah 48, uh, he said, uh, you have not been changed. Um, your taste, your leaves are still within you. Again, uh, if the sediment and the mixture of uh, habitual sin and compromise uh, is always there and it never changes, if it hasn't been filtered out, its taste and its scent has not changed. And that is an exact description of what the voice of apostasy does. It seeks to sidetrack people. So with steps that lead to apostasy, uh, and a professing believer, in fact, can have a conversion to the faith and may bear fruit initially, 
but he fails to take the truth, the warning, and the teachings from God's word seriously. So what happens is, instead of pursuing the Lord Jesus and his word first, and seeking first the kingdom, and seeking first his righteousness, and seeking first to share the gospel of salvation with the lost, instead of seeking first to make disciples, instead of seeking first to walk in holiness, they become sidetracked by the spirit of this age and the cares of the life, and pretty soon all they are is reporting is one situation after another. While there's a place for facts, facts, again, are subject to change. So if a person is falling into apostasy, they generally don't know it. The individual stops drawing near to God because he's influenced by too many activities, well-meaning things, even perhaps ministry activities, church activities. And again, if you are, um, if you live alone by yourself, um, there will be different priorities in, in your life as opposed if to the fact that if you were, have married, if you were married with a spouse and children in the home, your priorities would be a little different, wouldn't it be? We're talking about listening to a voice that would be increasingly tolerant of um, wrong experiences, uh, wrong practices, in sin in himself, um, old habits start to come back, uh, they fall back in to sin, uh, they fall back into um, uh, evil things that would catch them as it did in the past, their hearts then, other leaders and voices and experiences actually replace the first love. So if any voice, any leader, any movement, any person replaces the first love, which of course is Jesus. This is what Jesus talked to the church of Ephesus about. He said, you've lost your first love. Then what, what happens is they're not aware that, um, that they're falling away from their first love. So a heart can actually become hardened, okay? Uh, a heart can become hardened if you suffer loss or pain. As I mentioned earlier, if, um, if something happens in your life, people become offended. You can become offended. You think, if God really loved me, he would not have allowed this to happen, which, in fact, Jesus promises us and tells us, in this world, you will have tribulation. He said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Uh, if they were offended by me, if you're carrying your cross, let me tell you something, that message of the cross is offensive. People do not want to hear it. They don't want to hear about negativity. They call it negativity. If you talk to them about hell, you mention hell. If you talk about the judgment seat of Christ, if you talk about the great white throne judgment, if you talk about um, the wrath of God being poured out, they call it negativity. They will not hear it. The voice of apostasy does not want to hear about it because it's uncomfortable. Okay? Um, and so if an individual who has hardened their heart uh, and if it's continual, now I'm not talking again about dropping the cross, I'm talking about them saying, you know, I'm getting pretty weary of this, I don't like it, uh, if God loved me, you know, the enemy begins to come, the accuser comes in, and the voice of the accuser then begins to be heard, okay, or the voice of religious error will come in, and a, the heart can actually become hardened, and a person can, in fact, become deliberately, continually, and willfully choose to turn from God and choose to ignore the repeated voice and the warnings and the rebuke of the Holy Spirit. And he will rebuke. He will discipline. He will chasten those that he loves. And people don't like hearing about it. Um, I've had experiences in places where I've gone to minister. I, in fact, once, not too long ago... Um, I took a friend with me. She's an intercessor friend, and I was, you know, at the front ministering, and the Lord had me uh, speak about some things that what I would call a very piercing word. I mean, when the word of God comes, what does it do? It pierces. It divides between thoughts and intents of the heart, joints and marrow, soul and spirit. If there is active sin and compromise, compromise in the camp, the spirit of the Lord will address it because he hates sin because he knows it hurts us. And so I was addressing some hard things, and 
my friend who was sitting next to one of the leaders of this thing began to murmur and complain that this is nothing but negativity. Why doesn't she say this? Da 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 da. And you know, the enemy was basically mocking me. And my friend had to sit and listen to it, so she just began to pray in the spirit. But let me just tell you something. When the cross of Jesus Christ is taught, and when it's brought in love, when it's brought in context, when when Jesus comes, he will always, always challenge us, always, but he will also comfort us. He will also give us hope. So his message is when he comes, he will state the problem, but then he says, you know what, if you repent, then this is good, and I will give you this promise. When we read in um, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, when he brought these seven messages to the church, he basically gave a description of their condition, and he said, I see this. This is good, but, you know, you've got to repent over this one thing. And people will become offended. Uh, but anyway, if there is a deliberate and continual turning from God, all right, and if an individual continually ignores the repeated voice and warnings and rebuke of the Holy Spirit, they will be more open and susceptible to be following a counterfeit voice, the voice of apostasy. And they will think that they're fine. They will think they're right and justified. And they will think maybe, um, uh, you know what, there's, there's another avenue I need to pursue. And, and so they get caught up into some error. Now, the Holy Spirit is grieved and quenched. The scripture tells us he can be vexed, he can be grieved, and he can be quenched. All right? The voice of the Spirit. He is a person, beloved. He is God. There is... Uh, uh, something to be stated about that. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's called the, what we call the Godhead, the Trinity. Three persons. The Holy Spirit is God and the Holy Spirit is a person. All right? So if he's continually grieved, continually quenched, because his temple is violated. Again, the temple is our body, right? It's us. If he's continually grieved and quenched, if one who previously walked with the Lord continues down that path. That is very dangerous. That's what we call a backslider. And then they can become reprobates. And if there is no repentance within a pointed period of time, okay, what does God's word say? My spirit will not always strive with a man, right? The Holy Spirit will eventually depart from the former believer if he is uh, not welcome there. So this is something dangerous. What we're seeing now, what I'm seeing now is people are um, in, the, in the circle of people that I know. I'm talking friends, family members, church groups who I've ministered, especially with the different women's ministries. I am seeing now more of a running after spiritual experiences. They're running to get a quote, word from the Lord. They're running because they think that God is going to give them a mantle that they deserve. They are running because they want to see some kind of a supernatural experience or some kind of a lying sign and wonder. Friends, I could tell you stories. You wouldn't believe some of the things that I have seen. God's had me in the middle of it. It's been uncomfortable, but he had me there so that I could see in his word what's happening. What I'm seeing is that there is a blend, there's a toleration, you know, people's language. When the language begins to change, when there are four-letter words continually in conversations, let me tell you, they don't speak four-letter words in the heavenly realm, in the holy place where our Savior walks, where he lives, where he abides. When we see um, a flippant, careless attitude, when the sobriety is gone, when um, an individual is no longer grieved by gossip and slander, when they're no longer grieved when they hear about adultery and fornication, when they're no longer grieved when they hear about same-sex marriage being allowed in churches and also in the ministers themselves, that tells us we're in a serious place, all right? So the voice of apostasy versus the voice of the Holy Spirit is something that that we need to distinguish. And beloved, we cannot hear unless he opens our ears. I'm, 
this is something that I have to do all the time. I said, Father, I, I know that I'm naturally spiritually deaf. I need to be able to hear. Please open my ears. Please give me eyes to see. Please give me eyes to see. Please show me if there's anything in my life that is not pleasing to you because it will affect the way we hear. And so I would recommend if you've been listening or following someone and you can tell by their language, uh, you can tell some things after listening about 10 minutes. Uh, if the, there's not a reverential fear of the Lord, if they um, are tolerating uh, in their own speech, in their own lifestyle, and the way they talk, I would really back off and say, Lord, do you really want me listening to this voice? Now, let me just say this. Sometimes we have to walk through a pile of mud to find some nuggets. I get that. I know that sometimes we will. the Lord will lead us to watch movies or documentaries. John was talking about that. He will speak to us through different avenues. But what I'm saying is that the enemy's voice is so subtle. When the Lord began to talk to me about how the serp beguiles eat, began to show me how shrewd. We need to understand that this voice is really deceptive. Okay? It's subtle. Uh, it beguiles and it tempts, attempts to use trickery. It can change its form. And I won't go into that um, the voice of the serpent very much tonight. Uh, but what I want to say is the Lord began to show me how subtle it was. Um, and our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we read the Old Testament, we see that there were other voices that were coming in. And it's possible some of you listening are having to deal with this. When Sarah, uh, uh, Abraham's wife, uh, could not become pregnant, uh, Hagar and her had little conversations said, you know what, uh, I can't get pregnant, Hagar. Why don't you step in? So, you know, there are voices of human reasoning that come in. And there is voices of impatience. And um, that's part of the human condition. But what happens was when voices of human reasoning and impatience come, it causes Abraham to produce Ishmael. So. The problem here is the son of the flesh is going to persecute the son of the spirit. What happened? We know what happened when Ishmael came and then Isaac was born after that. God had to send Ishmael away. God said, no, this is not my promise for you. Uh, he will have a measure of blessing in his life, but Isaac is my promise. So what happens is when there's a man-made attempt to bring forth God's promise, God says it has to be sent away. Um, because the son of the flesh will persecute the son of the spirit. And some of you, in your home situations, I know you're dealing with this. If you are walking in the spirit, if you have made Jesus first, if you are in fact the bondservant of the Lord, and if you have family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and others who are not walking with the Lord in that way, you understand that persecution. It also happened with uh, Joshua when the Gibeonites, came in, and they actually were people of the land. The, um, this was subtle deception. This was false brethren that came in and moved against Joshua and the people. And they were very, very convincing. They had outward credentials. They um, had moldy bread. They had their wine. They, had their, uh, they were talking the right way. They had the right kind of speech. Their clothing was tattered. They said, look, we've come a really long way. We too are born from above, right? We're your brethren, just like you. We're born from above, just like you were. But the problem was they had compromised, and Joshua and the elders did not seek the Lord, and they made a covenant with the people of the land, and they allowed the practices of the heathen to live. So this was a voice of subtle deceit. These were false brethren who came in and mingled themselves with God's people. It also happened with Nehemiah. Okay, there were voices of intimidation and lies and slander that came against him. And this was a group. Um, you can read about that in the book of Nehemiah. Um, gentlemen by the name of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem said, come, let's meet together. And so what happened was when Israel's enemies found out that the wall was being rebuilt and the gaps were being repaired, they all schemed together. And their intent was to harm Nehemiah and to distract him. So enemies conspire to hinder the work of God by moving in among the people. So when the Lord begins to bless your life, your ministry, uh, your business, 
the enemy will attempt to move in and come together, not just one, not just two, but in this case three. They all came together to try to hinder the work. They also send in a false prophet. And Nehemiah knew. He said, I know the Lord didn't send this person. Um, also, voices of jealousy and murmuring will arise against you if you are walking in agreement with the Lord, if you are walking in the light, if you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Korah uh, actually was one that said, come. In fact, Korah attracted the influential leaders, the ambitious ones. These were men in the camp. Uh, who wanted to intrude into an office apart from what God had called him to. So Korah actually appealed to the princes in the assembly. Okay, he got, he got the bigwigs. Okay, he got the movers and the shakers to come together in agreement to move against Moses and Aaron, the famous ones in the congregation, men of renown. Okay, and so we have the fire of rebellion here. We have strange fire that has moved in. And it will, and it did, consume the rebels, and thousands died in a plague. You can read about that in Numbers chapter 16. Now with Balaam, okay, Balaam the prophet, voices of idolatry, greed, and covetousness were calling to Balaam. Uh, so what happened was the king of Moab told Balaam, he said, you know what, I'm going to give you gifts. I'm going to give you payment for your services. I'm going to give you rewards of, div of divination. I'm going to promote you to great honor if you do what I ask. So we have a prophet here who was a prophet, but he lacked discernment and he was blinded by greed. He had the gifts, but he didn't have a sanctified life. I want to say that again because this is a concern that I have. There are folks and our brothers and sisters, God help all of us, who have gifts they have words of knowledge. They have words of wisdom. They have dreams. They have visions, but not a sanctified life. All right? The error with Balaam was that he prophesied for wages. He cast stumbling blocks. So he caused people to stumble, and he loved unrighteousness. You can read about him in Numbers 22 and 25. Now, another voice and I'll talk more about this hopefully the next time we're together, is the voice of the harlot. And this voice appeals to the desires of a son who is naive. All right? So this is how the harlot tries to seduce a young son in the Lord, if you will. A young one in the Lord who's not yet seasoned, who doesn't understand what the bait looks like, what the trap really is. She came to him and says, you know, I have my own house, I have my own coverings, my own bed, I have my own perfume. Yeah, she had a counterfeit anointing, and this is what they have. This is a counterfeit anointing. And she offers love. She offers, she said, I'll stroke your flesh, and you can put on your own attire, and I'm going to attract you, I'm going to give you uh, gifts, uh, I'm going to persuade you, and if you do what I ask... Um, uh, I will give you gifts, and I will give you titles, and I will honor you. And she uses fair speech, and on and on and on it goes. And this is in Proverbs chapter 7. You can read about what the um, voice of the harlot does, and how it operates, and how it moves. And then finally, I want to say something about how the voice of the devil came to Jesus, because this is what he did. Um, basically, he wanted... Jesus Christ to commit high treason against his father. He told them, he says, you know you don't have to go to the cross. All right, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, the devil came to him. So this is the voice of the one who came to him. He says, I know who you are. You don't have to suffer or wait. You are a king. And so sons of God, even as the son of the, of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the Word made flesh, he was tempted in the physical, emotional, and spiritual arenas. And yes, he was tempted in ways that none of us will ever understand. But if we look at how the enemy came, he offered Jesus instant gratification, okay? He said, I'll give you any kingdom you desire and the glory they contain. I'll give you popularity. I'll give you riches. I'll give you success. And I'll give you one thing you want more than anything, Jesus. I will give you souls 
if you just bow down and do it my way through the power of your flesh and me directing you. So the enemy said, I will give you all of this. And Jesus did not contend with him. He is the prince of the power of the areas, the prince of this present world order. The whole present world order lies under the power of the wicked one. So the voice of the enemy came to him and said, you don't have to go to the cross, Jesus. I'll give you all of this. Just do it my way, independent of the Father's will. Did you hear that? A voice of the flesh, voice of the enemy, says you can bypass the cross. So worshiping Satan, in fact, involves bypassing the cross, taking the wider, more traveled path. You can read about this incident that Jesus had to endure in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and also chapter 7. So there are other voices which are presently attempting to distract us or hinder us, and they're also saying, come, all right? The voice of Sarah and Hagar went to Abraham and said, come, let's do it this way, all right? The voice of deceit, false brethren, this, they came as a group and they said, come, we've come from a far country, let's make a covenant together. The enemy plots together through voices of intimidation and lies and slander. Rebellion comes in when Korah says, come. Voices of idolatry, greed and covetousness call to Balaam. That, those voices are still active today. Okay? And again, this harlot and the whole religious buying and selling of the gifts. Send me your gift and I will send you a little trinket. The buying and the selling and the merchandise in God's house continues to this day. This is not new. The voice of the enemy will say to you and to me, you know what, I have a plan for your life. This can be your best life and you can do it through emotionalism. You can do it through natural talent. You can do it through the strength of your own will, through the strength and the power of your flesh. I'll show you how to do it. I'll show you how to get what you want. And you don't have to carry your cross. You don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to be this bond servant. It doesn't have to be hard for you. I will make it easy for you. These are other voices, beloved. These are voices that are clamoring for our attention. These are voices that will not confront sin and will not call you to repent. These voices will not say you have to deny yourself. These voices will not say that Jesus speaks to his bond servants, his voluntary love slaves. He shows them that which is coming. He shows them the future. He shows them the judgment of the great horror. He shows them the truth because they walk with the spirit of truth. He shows them the bride. He shows them the details of the parousia and the steps that lead to the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shows them the things which shortly must be done and will come to pass. So, beloved, as I finish now with you, there's a reason that the Lord says we need to come unto him. We need to draw near to him so that we can be a participant in what he is doing. We need to draw near to him so that we will not be deceived, so that we will not give voice to an enemy, because just as sure as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, I can tell you also that living in the age and the time and the season that we do, we also are hearing other voices, and he wants us to be able to identify those voices. And he is absolutely wonderful. He is absolutely committed to you. He is absolutely faithful to his word. And he gives hope to his people. Let me just tell you something. People need hope today. And I'll finish with this. God gives us hope and he reminds us that we have eternal life and to look for that blessed hope. Hebrews 6, 18, 19 says, we have a hope set before us. We have an anchor of the soul. Hope is the anchor of the soul. Beloved, we're just passing through this world 
and God will give us grace to pass our test, he will absolutely do everything he can. The voice of the precious Holy Spirit will warn us, he will comfort us, he will guide us, he will teach us, and he absolutely will not fail. To him be the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Terry, for joining us. God bless you. Love you. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye.